Yo, C-Mask viewers, it is Friday, which means it's time again for the Christian Masculinism Podcast with Will, Nick, Mike, and myself, Tim. That's funny, all of our names begin with I. I point that out every time. It just tickles me to no avail. And if you want to talk about Nicholas and me in one sentence, you can call us Tickle Us. That's something we learned <laughs> more recently. We're going to have to come up with compound names nice. for each combo of the two of the four of us. And it'll be extra gay. Um, and for today's show, of course, we are talking about another particular dimension of Christian masculinism, most specifically how it actually works and how Christian masculinism actually works is dictated to us in Holy Scripture in the second book, the, the second chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter two, verse 24 this it, in this one line is contained a world of how to that's pass it. it it needs to be unpacked and uh it will be unpacked this line reads as such therefore a man leaves his father and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh now full full story before um we go to the the, the men i'm running a class uh, uh called one flesh and I'm writing a book on this exact topic, and the book will be the text for the class. You don't, you don't need the book for the class, the class or the book. But I didn't even know that I'd named the book after Leave and Cleave and the class after the one flesh part, and they're both from Genesis chapter 2, 24. I took it as providence because leaving your father and cleaving to your wife is literally the only way, and I, I do mean this, the unique only way to do patriarchy so when i wrote the case for patriarchy and my wife wrote the hers ask your husband that was an establishment you know five years ago when we were writing these things that patriarchy is theoretically good and it kicked up all sorts of dust and a lot of you know the story that that followed and now a lot of people are willing to buy into patriarchy it, it's just it's changed the overton window lo and behold has been stretched moved rightward for the first time in a while. But we still have the cultural problem of lots of goofy dudes, goofball dudes running around. We were just having a laugh about many of these goofball dudes um, before the camera rolled that are suddenly charged with this lofty office of being the patriarch of a family, the, the, the real chariot for wife and kids to get to heaven. It's lofty. It's a big, uh, heavy as the head that wears the crown. And these are goofy dudes that have been basically crafted by a feminist society. And we're the four of us and all our books and all of our articles and our work and our documentary and, and now this forthcoming book and, and classes that Mike, Will, and I run, like this forthcoming September 11th, um, Leave and Cleave One Flesh class, go to timothyjgordon.com. That, those are all works to pull these feminized guys out of the fire and be like, Go have patriarchies. Go have households that are run by you and run well and do it well. And it's it's like um, taking a baby bird that has had no flying lessons yet or whatever and just throwing it out of the nest. So it doesn't even have wings yet. And they just plummet to the earth and uh, stick in the muck in, by their beak or something. There's no hope for success. So the, cl the new class and the new book, Leave and Cleave, One Flesh, that will go live in mid-September are all about here's how it works specifically. And the way that this begins, I thought it would be a great show for today is because this leave and cleave scripture um, shows, and I, I want to go to um, Mike first, then well, then Nick, it shows a, a paradox with um, case for patriarchy. I opened with this kind of prodding question. I, I love prodding questions in my podcast and even my books. I'm like, the average guy, I said in, in case for patriarchy, says, let me go ask my boss, and he means his wife. And then I just explicate, unpack why this is um, shockingly untrue and yet shockingly pervasive. Well, the, the paradox I open, me and Steph, because Steph's co-author, we open Leave and Cleave with is, imagine Marital Island, okay? I, I want you guys to comment on this. If you ask any goofball 
in uh, you know with a pot belly and being barked at by his wife and he, pretty much hating his life out in the burbs in England or America or any of the Western world. What if you could go to an a desert island with a beautiful woman, and it's pretty much exclusive to you guys. You're you're kind of supposed to be your own island, you and this theoretical beautiful woman, and. Uh, there are two quick bond glues we're going to talk about that, that pretty much always work and your appetites for these two quick bonds pretty much always renew, like Jerry Seinfeld says about app, spoiling your appetite before dinner as a child. The, another appetite's coming, right? You know, the two quick bond glues are you're there for sex and fun with each other. And of course, you have to do day, the daily work entailed by surviving. But um, you're there with the beautiful woman, desert island. She's going to, you know, just be there. You're going to have fun with her. You're going to be able to have sex with her. You're going to have to, you know, kind of kind of cooperate to work, to stay alive with her. And you kind of make your own island. Most guys out in the burbs are like, this is great. And you're like, okay. Um, now, filling your wife is this beautiful woman. Most of the dudes out in the suburbs are like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you said, uh, yeah, that that's a whole different thing. This is what's been done to the concept, to the prospect, conceptually, at the level of the concept, to marriage by the feminists. Um, and we'll just say the feminists, but the elites. They've done that. They've made that switch in the mind of man. Like They don't want to be alone because they're afraid of their wives. For some reason, their wives, it's really sad, are precluded from being said beautiful woman, abstract beautiful woman, who they're attracted to. Then all of a sudden you say, well, it's your wife. Weren't you attracted to her? Why did you marry her if you weren't? No, it's not my wife. And um, they don't want to be alone. They want to fill their weekends with, the, you know, her parents, my parents. I, well, I don't, you know, a lot of guys are like, I don't even like her parents, but we just go over there every weekend. Well, why do you go over there every weekend? Make it a marital island, you know, move out of state or something. Have some privacy. Don't you want your desert island? Can you guys just comment on this? I mean, it, it is a paradox. And the deciders, the they who run everything, popular media and control people's thoughts, have made this switch and, and most guys out in the burbs don't even understand it. So comment on any of that, Mike, and Will, then, then, then Nick. So for me, when I think of the leave and cleave, I think of a, a very much a, a spiritual disposition and a shift that has to happen. I come from a very close, tight-knit family and I knew and I understood that once I moved out and I was with my wife and we were living under one roof and we were married, that all of a sudden I had to create this sort of barrier of protection around us. And so as close as I am to my family and as close as she is to her family, that barrier is that protective mechanism against these outside voices that sometimes, I mean, neither one of our families have ever really gotten involved, but it's that idea that this could never be breached, that this has to be behind closed doors. Nobody can get involved in our conflicts. And I know early on in my marriage, that was an issue that I had. I would go to family with these issues. And that just leaves a, a gap, a path that the enemy could really uh, exploit. And so I felt like I was sort of half in, half out. And I came to this conclusion about a year into our marriage, or actually, yeah, about a year into our marriage that I said, hey, I need to move away from my, my city altogether. Not that my family was being a toxic influence, but I wanted to put myself, just like you said, uh, on marital island, so to speak. And so we moved here around my wife's family. But again, the contact even with them is somewhat at arm's reach because our priority is on our household. And there's even been conversations uh, recently about moving somewhere else altogether. So we're truthfully on this marital island that we are this one flesh union and in the home what does that practically look like that looks like me honoring my duties as protector and provider she as the homemaker the nurturer the 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 the, the person that makes the house into a home and through that you know that patriarchal order we raise up our children without really caring or paying much attention to outside influences whatsoever so for me it was a bit of like a spiritual shift and a spiritual disposition that prompted me to rip myself away from the band-aid that was my hometown yeah what do you say will you can see the same truth shown when things go wrong as well like one of the biggest problems in marriages today in my experience is when the husband doesn't know how to establish or uphold boundaries around his new family that he's created with his wife and his old family. So for example, 
maybe his mother keeps interfering and like seeing how the wife should do things and just running the show because she's been a helicopter parent in some ways, like throughout his childhood. Maybe he went to school, maybe he was homeschooled, but she was always just hovering over, trying to micromanage everything. And then when he leaves and should become independent and the patriarch of his own household, he can't. He's still just cucked to his own mother. And he's learned that behavior from watching what happened with his father as well. And then the wife doesn't trust him because she's seeing that they aren't really separate at all. And she sees that he's like a big kid still. He doesn't know how to implement what he understands in theory when it comes to the push and shove of actual day to day grind, which is where virtue has to happen. Like do the tough things because they're the right things to do, even though in the moment it might challenge all your bad habits, your effeminacy, your desire to be a people pleaser and say yes, especially if you love the people that you're agreeing with. That's hard for a guy to do. And suddenly he has to do it on this really serious level all at once when he's had no preparation for it comes crashing down often. Right. Such a good point. I'm just upset at the word cleave. Because my <laughs> entire life, I thought it meant to separate. Like a, a cleavage, a cleaver. This meant to drive things apart. And then I read this and it's like, no, cleave means to be as close as you could possibly be. And so I don't know, it's just confused me. I obviously am not married and have have nothing to offer that first question. <laughs> well, you Nick, know what could you address? You could address what the desert isle par paradox, I, I think, ably. Like, you, as maybe a single guy, isn't it, uh, for you, there's no difference yet between the theoretical and the as applied. And in, in weird cases, as, as the scientific method shows us, when there's some sort of dichotomy between theoretical answer, hypothetical answer, what it should be, and then add a, as applied answer, we know we have to go back and check our math, check our science or whatever. For you, it's still in the phase where it's like, okay, theoretical wife um, should be a be beautiful woman that I want to live the rest of my life with on desert island, you, you know, doing what we have to do, get our kids to heaven. That's our main charge. And, and the little boring daily chores to to keep things clean and safe. But I mean, then we're the, the two quick bond glues. I want to talk a lot about these are um, we're just going to have sex and fun with each other. And, and, and um, it's going to be great. Well, I mean, everyone you talk to, aside from us three guys and maybe a few blessed others, anointed others, are like, well, yeah, that's how you think about it theoretically. You know, you, you, but that's more like a um like in the office that's like a that's like a hypo desert island game where you pick your favorite celebrity actress that you want to do that with it doesn't actually work in real life they've been utterly jaded and they're like there's theory and then there's reality man you get married and then it's really like it's nothing like the desert island thing um i don't know i feel like you're in a really good position to see how absurd that is well, the way I always describe it is just a failure of imagination. And this is sort of what I was getting slightly frustrated with whenever the subject of um, divorce comes up, you know, when we were talking to Dr. Baskerville last week. And I'm just not, when I talk about marriage, I'm not talking about a woman who I would be really upset with most of the time and might want to divorce. That's all. And, and, it seems like a failure of imagination writ large that everyone assumes that that's not a possible world that you can live in. That's not a, that those types of women don't exist or that you can't even find somebody who you kind of half get along with and then build that sort of life, I guess. Um, I sort of chalk it up to, I don't know, the word romance doesn't really fit. The word fairy tale seems too glib, but just like, Hope, I guess, I maybe maybe it's just the theological virtue of hope. Like, do you have hope that good things are going to come? Do you have do you have faith in the sacrament that God has described? Which I guess the vast majority of people don't view marriage as a sacrament. Which is the other thing that I was kind of struggling with, um, Doctor Baskerville about uh, was just reading, um, Casti Canubi, 
and he talks about like what true marriage is and what true marriage is not. And he's like, well, true marriage is the thing that's going to last forever. And it's the thing that you're signing up for. And it's the thing between two Christians. And, and, and he just keeps qualifying like what true marriage is. And then he very clearly expresses what marriage is not. And what I've been fascinated by since I read <laughs> chapter five, case for patriarchy, making married life sexy and pre-marriage sexless, which is to say restoring the, the true orientation of sexuality, which is what the feminists inverted, um, is, is, is a really exciting, it should be a, a thrilling idea. Like Catholic marriage should be an electrifying idea for young men and women. It should be the coolest thing ever. It's good because of, because sex is so sexy. <laughs> Because everybody wants to have a sex. It's like you're telling me not only can I have sex with somebody that I like, but also it's going to make both of us like the happiest people in the world, actualize our potency. We might have kids and we're going to go to heaven. Holy crap. This is the greatest proposition in the world. So, yeah. 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 Most, uh, mo real quick, if I can, most guys have capitulated to, to, to the cultural doom, the doomer mindset, right? Like if you look at, uh, what Myron tweeted recently, you know, have six figures, be 35, sleep with 50 plus women. Most guys that don't even have one woman that they could even think about having as an option, let alone like 50 plus, they've just opted out completely. They've swallowed the black pill. And then on the other side, you have Catholics that are so poorly catechized on the the, the sacrament of matrimony. They don't even understand what it even means and it's come and and i realized too as i you know have gone through this convalidation process we just finished our assignments this this, this past week how uh precious and beautiful of a, sa of a sacrament that it actually is reading into actual like the, the the theology of it the morality behind it the 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 sacredness of the sacrament itself puts a whole new spin on how i even look at my wife it's completely different it's it's grown my love for her and then especially so uh, throughout the process, remaining celibate um, makes me appreciate it to such a degree that it's, it's almost even hard to put into words. So it's like not just like poor catechesis for Catholics. It's also like on the other side, those poor bastards that are just that are just doomers. I think how do we get those guys? That's what you were, ta you were talking about, Nick, is like hope. What hope do they have? Say. I'm well, not trying right? to make it turn it into some Disney thing. I, I literally just mean that yeah. the, whatever whatever marriage actually is as defined by the church, the more that I get to understand it through uh, what Tim's been writing and then what the popes have been mm -hmm. saying, that should be the most incredible proposition for two young people ever. And I, maybe it's because it's not – maybe it's because it's not clearly proposed um, mm -hmm. or like the media has just, just done such a thorough job of making marriage seem like – hell on earth i don't know i don't know so the 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 subtitle of this book that is on pre-order now you guys can everyone out there watching can go pre-order it and it, we're really hoping it arrives for the first class of the one flesh class which begins on september the 11th we're just finishing the writing this week the, the subtitle is nine christian marriage prep secrets once taught now censored and <clears throat> there's some insinuation there even censored by the church, censored by the world. I want to snake back from Nick, then then Will, then Mike, answer this. So our job as your authors on this book, on Leave and Cleave, is to take, wow, what is the mystery of this paradox that all these men have rejected the prospect of marital island? They love playing who's your favorite celebrity, go on an island with her. But real marital island, like Nick's saying, it's you get dewy-eyed as a young man thinking about this. You can make this a reality and it's your ticket to heaven. It's such a cooler life, in my view, than, than becoming a priest. Uh, and I, mean, I know you're supposed to wax on philosophically and poetically about how being a priest is the higher life. It's holier, but that doesn't make it funner. You know, I, I mean, this is the life I chose because, hey, you can still get to heaven and you get to have, a you know, a, a help me who you have sex and fun with. Well... I say that really it's, and I don't belabor the point because I already articulated it in case for patriarchy, the Daphne, uh, the Moon Beasley complex, um, which, which made premarital life sexy and marital life unsexy. I actually show how they did it. They just attacked the two 
quick bond glues that always will re-solidify things in your marriage. And they're quick bond because they don't, yeah, you should pray together. You should, you should um, grow in the faith together. You should work together, you know, labor out in the yard. And this bond, this is a, a slow bond. Prayer is a slow bond, maybe a, in some ways deeper, but the two quick bond glues that Moon Beasley really went after in the minds of the moldable masses were when you go to Marital Island, you get to have sex, like regular sex and regular fun with your wife. And they were so effective, Nicholas, that it even worked on the tradiest trad Catholic Christians that you know, if they're like, well, the sex is all about procreation. Mm, that's procreation is the primary end. It's the sole primary end, the telos. But there are secondary ends to, to sex. There is um, lips. Yes, lips are for um, eating slash speaking. I'm not sure which one's primary. But is it a mortal sin that there's a secondary end? You can whistle. Is whistling a mortal sin? Um, <laughs> these people, I guess, would have to say yes, because they've capitulated for a reason. Maybe their, their wives let themselves go, and these guys, are, I, I don't know what it is. I don't want to go through the whole psychologization process of it. But even the stodgiest um, trads, even the curmudgeons out there, have bought into the um, epoche, uh, Husserl would call it the bracketing, of quick bond glue number one. Marriage is great because if you go have sex with your wife, you will be making things better, even if you haven't talked maybe so much lately. It's always good and it's fun. Every, I mean, you don't have to encourage people to like sex, but they're like, no, no, it's only for procreation. We've had five kids and that means we've had sex five times it's not about attraction there's nothing natural to it it's all supernatural and they also in e the same crowd to, to show using the end member the most extreme case that would should be least likely to be persuaded by moon beasley complex trad catholics the same crowd says about fun block it off fun simplicitaire is for children it's for children um you know, you'd never wear a baseball cap or, you know, or, you know, you never play sports as a man with a job. That just, you're, that's arrested development. You're trying to be like a youth. You have a midlife crisis. You never have fun with your wife. You, you know, the, the marital economia, the, the household, literally the law of the household is what economics means. That's all about duty and um, cr cr Christian responsibility and vocation and soteriology and, you know, getting one another to heaven. That's not about having fun, just as it's really not about having sex outside of those five times in 25 years that we did uh, have sex. I put a bag over my wife's head. She didn't need to put a bag over my head because I'm, you know, 300 pounds. So we made sure we didn't enjoy it. And it was five times and we're never going to touch each other again for the rest of our 25 years of marriage. Took the light bulbs out of the bedroom. There's just not even a light bulb in there. It's all, no. always off. In case something were to happen once every <laughs> three years, uh, yeah, we we take the light bulb out, and that's probably an act of charity uh, on the behalf of my wife because I'm 300 pounds. But I put a bag over her head. We keep the paper bags in there, and <laughs> everyone's bought into it. Young unmarried people, young married people, you know, just everyone you know is like, yeah. So anyway, so you comment on this, Nick. Uh, the two quick bond blues have been utterly ruined in most people's minds. Can I just add in something about hope? Nick mentioned it a couple of minutes back. And if you think about what it actually is, so a, a firm desire for a difficult good, like huh. this is tough to achieve, but I know it's a genuine good and it's worth working towards. Hmm. And I think that it's possible. Part of the crisis surrounding marriage is just related to the general crisis about masculinity, which is men hearing they're supposed to do hard things on X or wherever, man up, do hard stuff. But when it comes to actually finding a woman, getting married, accepting that a lot of your marriage will about be about wearing away each other's weaknesses with God's grace to help you, because that's how it works as a sacrament, she'll become more feminine you'll become more masculine. You can work it out on the journey together. And yes, it's going to be hard. It's a form of conflict. Being too much of a bitch to actually accept that, like the work involved in finding a woman, maybe she's not a virgin, right? 
it's okay. You're still going to be okay. And they'll just say, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then I won't even get married. I don't know how. I have to have it right now on a plate. Perfect. Guaranteed it's all smooth sailing. But that's the problem, that expectation. And they'd still fuck it up if it was served to them perfectly too. Quick note. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. They would still. Yep. Yeah, I think, Will, what you're expressing, there. I guess there's sort of three kind, three buckets that a guy would fall into. Um, the first would be the, uh, we'll, we'll say the Coolidge bucket in reference to the Coolidge effect, which was a, a study done um, about novelty, uh, specifically on rats, but then the um, pornography researchers leveraged that for studying why uh, pornography is so addicting. And that's just the idea that a guy who can uh, sleep with a lot of women will struggle with the concept of monogamy because they're just on the hedonic treadmill. They need that novelty. And that would probably be like the red pill guys. And I think that's probably where most of the time you see the resistance to marriage is they don't want to give up the novelty. Um, and they also, of course, can't conceive of a woman who would be superior to the previous 50 women that they've been with in the way that they think superior means, yeah. you know, because they're, they're not accounting for virtue. So they're like, they're, the 51st women isn't going to be better than the previous 50. So I just need another 50 and I'll just keep doing this until I die. That's like bucket one, why they wouldn't get married. Bucket two, I think, is what Will just described, which is sort of the gluttony of particularity. That pride and autism and shelteredness and all manner of things have come together to create somebody who wants something a very particular way. This is this is something that I've been um, realizing that I am very vicious about. It's just this gluttony of particularity. You want things a certain way. You get upset when they're not a certain way. You'll get in your own way if they're not a certain way just to make sure that it doesn't work. Um, and as Mike said, even if it was perfect, you'd still fuck it up. You'd find a way to mess it up because that's just who you are. Because you're in it. Because you're imperfect and you're now in right. it. Yep. Scott yep. Hahn calls that, Nick, the narcissism of small differences. Great, great term. Ooh. But, hmm. Yeah. It's a good yeah. point. I tuck, tuck that away. Narcissism of small differences. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that's a very, very real thing. And then the third bucket, which I actually think bucket one is quite small. Very, very small number of guys who are just like drowning in women and don't want to settle down. It's an extremely small number of guys who are preaching to the second bucket, which is probably maybe 25%. Maybe it's like 1% preaching to 25% where then they have the gluttony of particularity and they can't even get one girl, let alone right. 50 or 100. Right. And and they're like, okay, well, these guys who can get all the girls are saying this is what the best woman is and I won't right. settle till I get the best women. <laughs> Right. And wait, we're sorry to interject. Yeah, I sure, sure. try not to interject. But the the red pill goofs, I'm going to say goofs because it's YouTube. I, I don't say this when I interact with them on Twitter. <laughs> Myron says it's unrealistic for most of these sort of common guy, flabby guys who aren't trailblazers by their nature. It's unrealistic for them to get one wife. What they really need to do that's realistic is go out and score 50 chicks. <laughs> they say this unironically. Yeah. It's fucking ridiculous, man. I, I, I mean, yeah. they are so clearly CIA operatives, in my yeah. view. I mean, that was my opinion. I think it's so clear. There's a chance. I'm opining. These guys have to be CIA population control ops. So, like, don't get married until when? Do when does everyone become infertile? Thirty five. <laughs> And it is just not realistic for for these dorky losers to get one woman. So so go get fifty first. What? Yeah. All right. <laughs> that was so my opinion. That, I don't know anything. If if that describes twenty six percent, one percent, and twenty five percent, then the bottom seventy four percent. Last time I screwed that math up. Um, the bottom seventy four percent, I think, are if if you if you read. Atlas Shrugged, people who don't even want to engage in life as an act of will. 
if they're married, it's kind of by accident. If if they move, it's because they sort of had to for whatever, like the job merger that happened. They are not right. participating in existence as an act of will. Right. And you really can't even excite them at the idea of marital island. Um, I think it was Augustine that said it's better to be lost in passions than to have lost your passions. Mm-hmm. And and that's somewhat similar to what Christ says about being lukewarm. He's going to spit you out of your mouth. Like if you're going to be full evil, like just be full evil, be a hedonist. Believe that you should be sleeping with as many women as humanly possible because you, at least you think that's a good. And then if you're going to be some autistic Spurg trad wearing a derby who says that he's only going to like – marry a a virgin who descended from clouds all right then then hold that position you're both off your rocker the truth Mm -hmm. is somewhere in the middle we'll get you there but the giant swath of people when they hear about marital island they it doesn't there's no fizzing in their brain of like ooh, what really because like they just watched the next season of whatever marvel drivel popped up on disney plus Mm -hmm. like that's right. what's exciting to them. Also, there's um, no like fire under them properly because society tells them that it's okay to cohabitate and fornicate if you want to. And if you've got those two things, you're already play acting being on yep. Marriage Island anyway. That came out from a survey as the top reason why guys don't really have the motivation to get married now. Like they said they can oh. get all the perceived benefits of it without doing it you can get a girlfriend live with her have sex with her and that way you just emasculate yourself as the eternal teenager forever and you can split the rent you can split the groceries you can split the netflix bill because well she's not my wife like she's got a job it it just perfectly castrates and cauterizes every nerve ending in the human spirit and i don't actually have i have truly no idea what to do with that 74 percent swath of the world well they they know about accountability then right hey pay your netflix ha huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah then they yeah. then they recognize responsibility and accountability and they recognize it in so far as they they um contracept I, i'm not yeah you know, this isn't my big issue but contraception makes all of that um play acting go forward sorry mike no it's okay i think we've just we've gotten so far away from god and the meaning of the sanctity of marriage that this is not even on the on, on a guy's radar, even yeah. even even me as a guy that identified you know as a Christian, even despite having this this past with my wife, these things were in my head. Why? Because our nature is to be self centered and, and 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 we worship ourselves, right? That you see this with the red pill guys. You don't realize how this plays out. It's and there's different sort of angles to it. There's the contraception. There's feminism. There's this you know all all the stuff that we frequently talk about. It kind of comes from pride and selfishness. And but Mike, understanding. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I didn't want to. I was just saying this is why I meet everyone where they're at because Pope Francis tells me to do so. That's why the book says, "Look, the two focus on the two quick fixes first. Quick bond glues. That, that's why I was asking Nick about this as an unmarried guy, and you and Will about. But you literally get Marriage Island where you're you're supposed. It's good for your marriage, like. The Catholic Church, when it taught Catholicism, you know, 60 years ago or so, in in, in marriage prep manuals, we're, we're going through an old marriage prep manual. They say have lots of sex and have lots of fun mm. together. That, that they So we're meeting the guys where they're at. The natural drives are actually, as long as they're natural, they're good appetites. And it's tougher to get these mostly paganized guys to go pray or to be to really enjoy the suffering aspect of monogamy, like Tolkien writes to his son in letter 41, it's always a suffering. Monogamy is always a suffering for a man. But so we're not trying to get them to go the hard part first, but easy part first, which you make your marriage a minus just by having lots of sex and lots of fun together. Make sure the main person you're having fun with is your wife. The only person you're having sex with is your wife. And that that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to meet them where they're at. Like, don't talk to them about the life of prayer and suffering um, first and what might well, all the many dangers that could come from having a family talk to them about what you should be doing daily and weekly so i mean some sex and some fun on the weekly 
And guys are just, they, they have cotton in their ears, Mike and Will. But it, it's weird. Like, don't you want to go have sex with your wife? I'm like, no, I walk the dog after dinner because she's the wife, not the dog, barks at me more. And, um, you know, we're just fight. And it's like, okay, take even the aggression you guys have toward each other and just go have whatever aggressive sex or something. <laughs> I don't get like you're supposed to be doing that. And like, aren't you, you're not attracted to each other at all where you can't even just have like weird quasi arguing sex with each other. I don't understand it. Like you'd rather walk the dog and she's just going to watch the Kardashians or some shit on TV where it's like, okay, we know what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be getting along. Great. I don't, we don't have great conversation because that's not the kind of couple, you know, that the 74% are. They're not the kind of couple that come together and have really like interesting, even passing trivial Seinfeld S conversation. Okay, so just go have sex more often or just go do some activity, some Marvel movie enjoyer level of activity, you know, go bowling or something more frequently join a bowling league together and then go have sex. If, if you and your wife are more normies that aren't driven by conversation, why aren't more couples doing that? I mean, I kind of answered my own question, but you see what I'm saying, Mike? I think once you secularize marriage, you get so far away from God, you, and you, by virtue of that, you just kind of sap the fun and enjoyment out of it. So now you have all these, th these depictions of marriage and media that it's just this miserable thing where the man, it eventually just makes a man, a man dumb and retarded and in incompetent and incapable. And then the woman is always just like, well, see, I told you, if you wouldn't just, you know, and it's the woman being the, 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 the mother hen of the household. So, and guys, I, I'm, as time goes on, as I get older, I start to think that mo the majority of men, most people in general don't have an inner dialogue and they don't really think past the surface level. So you take, they just don't. And it blows my mind yeah. to think about that, that, <laughs> that possibility, but I don't think people think about it beyond the surface. So they're being sold. They're being sold as false bill of goods. They're like, yeah, okay. I guess I'll just continue to beat off to butt stuff on, on, on corn hub. And that's, that's life. So why would it be fun? But also for the, the, the trads too, it's like, are you ignoring what St. Paul said? I believe it was, I can't remember if it was first or second Corinthians that it's better for a man to get married than to burn with passion. So it's like, okay, then where are you putting that passion then? Is, could he be talking about not just a primary function of sex, which is procreation, but also the secondary function, which is pleasure. I think that's what's implied there. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. No, that's it. It's one of the secondary ends is remedy for concupiscence. And What's so sad is that the couples where they're not actually receiving that grace that they would get from the marital act, because marriage is a sacrament, and then like the channel of grace is the marital act. Often the husband's going to be addicted to porn, and sometimes the wife too, because they're not actually giving each other that remedy for concupiscence. So you think you're being um, holy and virtuous by not engaging in sex, but actually you're ending up somewhere far worse backfires well will do you uh, think sorry go ahead do you, do you think well that um i don't know i wonder if it's natural or preternatural the disconnect that has been hardwired so i guess softwired softwired into the minds of most of these guys that they can't I, I don't even like him using the term because it's the, the YouTube algo, but they can't surrogate their wife's They I'm not saying this would be good. I mean, just prawn is disgusting, but they're prawn addled, prawn addicted. They can't just be like, well, just think of your, your wife sexually, whatever you're thinking of there that's that's deeply sinful i mean to make sure it's a illicit act but but just kind of substitute your wife or that's what i was saying about the fantasy the sort of pg-13 fantasy of um, a movie star on marital island just imagine your wife yeah. you know it, on that and and it, you know if if you're like well she let herself go okay imagine her 15 or whatever 45 pounds lighter work toward that reality with her and then buy her like a bikini you know, after you've worked toward her and then, okay, now make her the, the object of that fantasy. Do you think that's a natural or a preternatural thing? Cause it's such an obvious fix that it suggests preternaturality. I think it's a mixture of both. I think we've, we've got this tendency towards disorder and to seek easy stuff 
that feels good in the moment, like avoiding having a hard conversation with your wife about physical fitness in that case, or you doing the hard work on your own physical fitness. So just by walking around the house, you're communicating to her far more powerfully than words ever could that you have high standards and you care about them and live them out. There's that aspect to it, but I think, sure, there's something preternatural to it too. The way that you can tell guys, don't forget, it's virtuous, it's meritorious to actually fantasize about your wife. As long as what you're imagining is licit and you're doing it in a way that doesn't push you too far down the arousal slide, let's call it that, um, it's a good thing to do. Like You can do it throughout the day. That's the way you can actually order your desires properly. And it, who knows, maybe it'll help you quit porn. And then they'll be thinking, I, what, what, fantasize about my wife? Like when I'm driving around in my car? Yeah, you can do that. It, it's healthy, right? Start doing it right now. Oh, I can't. That's, it's lustful. But then they'll be thinking about porn instead. It's crazy. Right. And it's so, also, right. that they're fantasizing about your wife too, because I, I do that about my wife all the time. It's really good for uh, polarity in the home as well. You don't have to be totally. in the bedroom. If that's kind totally. of what's on like the back of your mind and you're always, I, I look at my wife constantly, constantly. And it comes across in my demeanor toward her, whether it's in jokes or comments or, you know, how I grab her, obviously appropriate in front of the children, but, you know, no holds barred when the children are not around. That's good. That keeps that energy alive. Does it not? Yep. Well, if you're clutching like- your pearls, listening to that, if you're squirming in your seat, you're not mentally healthy. Right. But that's yeah. what has been subverted, I think. Like that's that's literally precisely what Tim talks about not being or being inverted. Um, so, but I, but I think there's there's two categories of what happened there. The first is what you guys just described, where uh, the religious mind is manichaeistic now, and they hate sex writ large, or they think that the only expression of sex is when it's illicit through pornography, mm. basically. Yeah. That's that's the only way in which sex is actually expressed, not that it's supposed to be that way, but that is how it is. And then they can't even conceive of a world in which that. And so I don't know how many months ago I asked, you know, Will said something like chastity is the same virtue inside of marriage as outside of marriage. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Because what I just heard you say was never have sex even inside of marriage. And what you guys what he said then what you guys just described now is like, no, the appetite is good. It was put there for a reason. It's a natural, good appetite. All right. Christianity is proposing is that you properly orient it. And the way that it's properly oriented is within marriage. It's not killing the desire like you're a Buddhist. But there's something I think even more sinister that's happened to the 74%, which is they actually don't even feel guilt with pornography. Mm-hmm. They don't feel guilt with fornication. Which is, uh, and again, like Christ spits out the lukewarm, or like St. Augustine says, it's better to burn with passions than to have lost your passions. Because they don't even have the sensitivity of conscience or of mind to recognize the value of the thing itself. Fornication and pornography aren't perversions of a good thing. They're just a thing. And the sexual appetite becomes just kind of being peckish. They're like, I just, I want something like salty, but also like a little bit sweet. And there's kind of like munch, you know, because they're like hungry in the evening. And it doesn't even phase them that what they are consuming, what they're choosing to consume is like the life creating act itself. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it is like a kind of a spiritual obesity when a person like overeats. They don't actually totally. know what a natural what a natural yeah. appetite is. So it's it's yeah. so dysfunctional. But it's that on a spiritual level. I remember being addicted to porn and being that promiscuous guy. I didn't even know what natural sexual desire even was. And now that I'm so far and away from that, and it's literally just me and my wife, and there's no self abuse and there's no uh, corn, is that, and it's all channeled toward her. It's actually like it's there. But it doesn't control me, and she lights it on fire, and it's there when I want it and there when I need it. It doesn't, you know, you see all this stuff online where it's like, man, if you're not thinking about sex all day long, there's something wrong with you. I I think there's something wrong with you if you're thinking about sex all day long. When it's properly ordered, because I've experienced the extremes on, on both sides, it's there when you need it to be there. And there's like a bit of an awareness, 
but it's not like a distraction. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it's it's healthy. It the, feels healthy. The uh, obesity um, analogy actually continues a little bit because when you're a diabetic, you can't go long without food. So yeah. th- if if you're always thinking like I need a snack, I just need a snack, I need a snack right now. It's like because you you're 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 so fat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these guys these guys are sexual diabetics. Let's let's. <laughs> yeah. let's <get> it. <laughs> I uh, I do blame squarely a lot of this on uh, Nick keeps saying Manichaeanism, Neoplatonism or, or Platonism simplicitaire. I fundamentally do not understand. Why, in, this is a topic for another show, why, why in Christianity we keep going back to the Plato well. I mean, outside of the doctrine of ontological participation, there, there's Plato's wrong on basically everything. Um, Aristotle was right on basically everything. And there's this Neoplatonic myth that um, Plato and Aristotle like go together. It's just not true. Uh, whether you're talking ethics, politics, uh, physics, metaphysics, epistemology, I just don't get it. And I think a lot of the body hatred comes naturally to Christians. One, because Catholicism is being Calvinized. You see all kinds of cosmological, ontological, and in and, and the realm of physics, Calvinization of, of Roman Catholics. We're now afraid of science, uh, good science, the way that, that um, the Puritans are. And you you see it. I've I've watched it happen over the last five or six years since I've been online with um, even marital sexual ethics. People really are still mad at me and Will. What's his name? Thomas Wagner or something. I mean, there are people that are like, Will and Tim are perverts because they they defend kind of robust marital sexuality. Even though we always say, make sure it's licit. You know, go check your your moral manuals. Well, what kind of what kind of libertines say that? So I just, I blame it all on Plato and it's easier. And um, I, I still, I, every once in a while, I, tw- I tweet at Ed Fazer, like, why are you still saying Plato and Aristotle? It's Plato versus Aristotle. But I, I want to close with um, this concept of marital spats, the marital spat cycle, because in some ways this is, in some ways, you know, what's worse in diet, um, toxicity or depletion, really what, what I, you know, I once heard a great nutritionist say that the depletion is 90% of the problem. Toxicity is only 10% of the problem. I, I think the same thing in relationships. I think the depletion of sex and fun, really looking to whet your appetite with, with sex and fun, which should be a daily weekly thing is 90% of the problem. But um, there is this 10% of toxicity. People don't know how to fight. They dread the fights. The fights are too long. It's a lot of this is feminism, but not all of it. I describe in the book something that the other psychotherapists have described um, at w- what happens in fights. So everyone knows, you know, I call it the relieving and recleaving cycle. And relieving <laughs> is a good thing. Relieving is when you re- all the built up tension and stress um, comes out in a, in a seemingly sudden, seemingly um, outsized argument over the, the car seat won't get in the, the won't snap in and, we're late to an in-law's house or a household appliance breaks and the man has to fix it and the woman's behind it. What was something accidental or happenstance leads to an outsized disproportionately large fight. And I think a lot of guys with feminist wives out in the burbs are terrified of this, the, the relieving where all the stress of the last X weeks, however long your cycle is as a married guy, um, It all comes out and it turns into like a half a day or a day long fight or for some guys it's all weekend long and they never really resolve it. And then the end of the cycle, if you have any kind of healthy marriages, you re-cleave, you come back together. And for the next 36 to 48 hours, everything's on autopilot. It's automatic. You just automatically want to be together. You don't have to try to exercise patience after you solve the fight because you've re-cleaved to each other and think you're like, I just, I hope we go on like this forever. Sometime after two days, you begin, um, everyone, cause of, cause of, um, two doctrines, concupiscence and the, the doctrine of, um, uh, compunction. You naturally, you can't keep that up forever where you're on autopilot forever. Just grateful to be recleaved to one another, the house and the, nothing like a, a state of a household divided against itself. You're in a state of civil war. The popes describe this in really poetic ways at times, the husband and wife fighting. 
So what we give is, you know, fights on Marital Island. You're there only with each other and fighting is hell. Um, what we give are specific daily tips. Here's what to do on the day of the fight. Conversational prompts that that really work. We wrote these um, a while back. Then you, you, you follow up the day after the fight, then three days after, then five days after, and you re revisit the fight with specific conversational prompts. It will not only get people, and this is in the Leave and Cleave book, not only get you out of the fight, but we say it'll double your cycle. Um, that it'll double the length, the duration of how long you go between fights because that of that period that everyone knows, everyone who likes at least their girlfriend or their wife, um, man, you just want to live in that space where it's automatic right after a fight. You, you're not even exercising patience because once you come back together, you come back together hard. And, you know, a lot of times in marriage, there's makeup sex. And beyond that, it's just you're so happy to be out of the state of interpersonal war, the horrors of war, and um, just so patient with each other. We show through these conversational recitations and, and you get people talking, not just the day of the fight, the day after, three days after, five days after, how to lengthen that out and how to keep the cycle long. That's specifically in the book. I'm not going to go through that, but I just want to talk to you guys about how how fights work, uh, particularly Mike and Will, I mean, like, people are terrified of, men are terrified of women now. Husbands are terrified of their wives. They're, they have the most unhealthy approach to fighting, even more unhealthy than their approach to sex and fun. And they've just, they're like, let your wife win all the time. Um, it's the most unhealthy thing. I, I've only talked to one other guy, it was Elliot, um, alumnus of CMASK, who said he argues with his wife less frequently than I think what I purport to with Steph, but he said he just never fights. I'm like, I, okay, I, I, we got to talk. I'm curious about that. I, I've always been curious about that. How do you have the never fight being concupiscent? But um, I think fights are inevitable, um, notwithstanding what Elliot said. And we just show how to keep it rare. And, and that's a big part of the book. There's a whole chapter on fighting where we go through the recitations. Um, Will and Mike, what Will then Mike, what are your fights like? And um, how do you keep them infrequent? And how do you how do you solve them at this point? Relieving and relieving. Hey, uh, Will, I sorry, I got to hop off in like a couple minutes. If you don't mind, okay. oh, I'll, Mike, just, yeah, I'll yeah. jump in. Yeah. yeah. So for most guys, their, their issue is that they don't know how to say no, they don't know how to put their foot down which then just causes a cycle to perpetuate. And those cycles actually become shorter. Um, the way that you put it was so well. Uh, my work is the opposite. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed already. I'm an asshole. I'm a bit of a dick. I feel bad for my wife sometimes because I'm just like this, a big block engine that's just like burning all the time. And uh, typically it's, if we're talking honestly, but where our fights typically come from, it's either I'm pissed off about something and it's hard for me to keep it contained. And that's continual work for me. I've gotten far better at it, obviously, uh, now than, than than before. And that's that's the cross that I have to bear as a married man. And then for my wife, she she keeps the home so orderly to the point where if that gets disrupted, sometimes that throws her off. And so the conflicts are typically about those sort of household duties. She's happy to do them all, but I'm a messy guy. She's not very messy. And sometimes that's where sparks fly. But when things go really sideways, it's typically, it's typically when I can't hold my cool. And I'm not going to say that I hold 100% of the fault or the, the the responsibility. But in a lot of these conflicts, it's it's me not just being able to just like sit in that anger and that discomfort for a little bit. And the what I, how I interpret like love your wife like Christ loved the church for me is just like don't be angry at your wife often, or try to at least like contain that anger. And so what makes it worse is that and, you know, um, not having a conversation about it, which I'm typically very avoidant. And so what typically resolves it is taking five to 10 minutes apart, just kind of letting the steam cool down a little bit, coming together and actually having a conversation about it, but not in an accusatory sort of way, or you did this, or I did that. It's really trying to approach it. And this sounds really, really cheesy, but it's, it's not us against, it's not us against each other. It's us against the problem. And so if you're arguing with your yeah. wife, uh, you're entering her frame and then you become the wife. And that's always in the back of my mind. It's like, just do not argue with her. And there's two different, there's two, typically two um, situations. There's either you need to kind of contain it and put it in her place 
and that's just with logic and just containing it and walking away. Or you actually have to sit down and have a conversation with her and hold space for her. Because if you're just going to be a hammer all the time, I mean, you're just going to kill your marriage from the inside out. That's just my quick just synopsis off the top of my head. It's a good uh, synopsis. It is. Uh, yeah, I will uh, catch you guys next week. I'm going to circle back to this one. I'm curious to hear your response, Will. Cool, Mike. Thanks. Love you guys. God bless. You take care, man. Have a good week. So what Mike was talking about there, about when you argue, you lose. I think it's true 99% of the time because the man has accepted the frame within which the woman is actually setting the terms of the argument. And there's a great image from a clinical psychologist about how nagging works. Harriet Breaker. She writes that nagging is the human equivalent of shock grids to the rat. It's like the man, oh, I've done something wrong. And again, and again, and again, and again. And he just gets nagged into the exact pattern of behavior that, that the wife wants to see from him. And look, sometimes she's got a point and the man needs to have various kinds of effeminate behavior nagged out of him. But when that framework within which the nagging is occurring and the goal at which the nagging is aimed is feminism, right? A feminist model of marriage, then when you're arguing within that, you've lost. And the man feels like he's trying to comply. Like, I'm doing everything you want. Why isn't this working out? Why are you still nagging me? It's because you're going somewhere impossible that's contrary to natural law. The, the wife is losing out the more he progresses into the feminist model. He's losing out too, but that's where they both think they should be going. There's no resolution to that kind of argument except him just rejecting the whole framing. So you can argue, but make sure it's in the right way about the right things. In terms of me personally and what I struggle with, similar to Mike in terms of personality type, you've got to start with the four temperament types, right? And know what your strengths and weaknesses are. So once you've got a good understanding of just who you are in life generally and the things to watch out for in yourself, you know that those are the areas that in your marriage are going to flare up most. So from what Mike was saying there, it sounds similar to me in that he's choleric. So that means that you, you like, you're direct, decisive. You can be tactless sometimes. You can be insensitive sometimes. I'm the same way. A lot of guys who just set goals and do it without complaining are going to be like that. And that means the things to watch out for in your marriage, maybe you get angry over small stuff. Like you'll set some kind of standard that for you is a no brainer. And then your wife might find it hard to actually live that out, whether it's a budget, whether it's exercise routine, whatever it is, some kind of routine that you think is just obvious and should be stuck to doesn't fit her. Um, the same thing might apply if your wife has one of the softer temperament types, like maybe she's melancholic or phlegmatic, for example, and she's more inclined to sloth or effeminacy. And you can't put yourself into her shoes about that. So it's not being like generous or sympathetic in how you appreciate where the other person is coming from. And without conversations about that, then those things fester and they either just blow up or they just keep festering for ages on like a low level resentment. That's why the conversation is important. I would just I throw in I... there from a perspective standpoint that fighting is used as a reason, um, one of the many reasons why guys shouldn't get married. They... It, it's ex it's expressed as something that you're going to have to do all the time, that it's sort of a, a feature, not a bug. Um, and I think that is deeply rooted in a feminist perspective that the woman is your equal, that it's there's two captains of the ship and you just have to negotiate with this other person on like how to steer the ship all the time and that you have diverging uh, goals and so you have to be in constant negotiations to try and keep the ship going in a particular direction. And none of that's true. I think that if two people, a man and a woman, are of reasonable virtue and they're not feminists, then quote-unquote fights should be quite infrequent because this isn't a democracy. So if the guy's leading and she's following and you guys both aren't like degenerates, so there's reasonable virtue abounding, then 
I, I don't think that fighting should be something that is presented to a guy as a reason why he should avoid marriage. Well, that's, that's true. It definitely isn't a reason he should avoid marriage, but I'm talking about the kinds of, so I guess I should stipulate because every, everyone's here kind of taking the Elliot, um, approach i'm not yeah it, it, this has nothing to do with feminism this has to do with if we're using the ship analogy captain of the ship who's ultimately in charge and um second in charge because you do have you do have a counselor there um so we we like so we've i've done podcasts with steph where we talk about uh fe you know feelings being hurt you know if you have a wartime consigliere in a in a in a peacetime consigliere there's naturally um, hurt feelings when someone's your your counselor. I mean, you don't have two wives like a wartime and a peacetime, but that that would hurt her feelings even worse <laughs> if you're going to one. But like wives are counselors, and so what 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 happens um, sometimes is look, I'm not mad, you know. I just yeah, you know, I I have my feelings hurt a little bit because I I I mean, men and women do have different strengths and any two people have different strengths. So I think one of the, one of the dangers of just preaching patriarchy and people not under understanding it because they've been raised in this dirty water is like, okay, patriarchy me, I, I guess we're, it, it's the danger of giving into the caricaturization of it. It means just the man's always right. I mean, that's definitely, definitely not the case. I mean, imagine have these being having to I was saying this the other night we were on a, a walk uh with Steph and, and your girlfriend Nick and I was like imagine having to follow one of these goofballs because maybe <laughs> maybe someone picks up case for patriarchy and they're like okay no I'm just right about everything like that's not and I'm not saying I'm not mischaracterizing Elliot's position but like no a well-ordered marriage is hey you know a woman gets one one by as a counselor a help me one bite at the apple as we say in law and one chance to sort of convince, Hey, I think, I think this is the way it's, it's not about which direction the ship is traveling, but how to get there, how to circumnavigate storms, which happen extemporaneously. So like, yeah, if uh, what a lot of the guys out in the burbs are doing is they're trying to sail North and their wives want to sail the ship, like bump them out of the way, take the helm and go South. That's, that's that kind of fight should never happen, but I'm talking about, um, okay, we want to go West, West, Northwest, there's a storm that's arisen. That's usually what causes fights between healthy people. Something you have to at, react to in real time. There's a close case for should we should we circumnavigate it to the west side or to the east side? Um, now, if it's a topic about which your wife knows more than you, and there there are lots of those um, between Steph and I. It's funny, funny people people don't characterize me as saying that. Then it's like you want to lean into what what your counselor is saying, particularly when they know more about it, and you're like, well. So you get all kinds of insecure guys that are like, should I take my counselor's advice? It's like, yes, if if they're right. If they're right, then they're being the one that's closer to recto ratio. And, um, but sometimes it's like, well, they might know more, but you, you have still a male, you can do the math faster because you have a male brain and you're like, even though you know more here, no, we're still gonna go this way. But so that's often, when we're talking about the car seat not snapping in and you're getting into an in-law's house, it's not that your wife wants to go south and you want to go north. It's more complex than that. And it's that, I mean, you know, look, the Prince of the Apostles, like Peter, was a goofball who you can't just follow everything he does. Sometimes Paul has to say, you know, Council of Jerusalem, like, you know, no, man, um, you, you, you're not you're not following out what, what we decided. Uh, you know, you have to have interventions. And and Good wives who are not feminists will have to intervene with their husbands and say, I, I really, this is my one bite of the apple, but I really think we need to go this way. That's what's happening a lot of times. And when people are fallen um, and they're trying to snap a seatbelt or whatever, a car seat, a kid's car seat out in the hot sun, it's easy for them to be short tempered with each other. So I, I, I do, in the chapter on fighting, we carefully avoid not just saying, oh, you should never fight. By, by fight, we mean work around, work through problems and where you're each explaining your point of view. It, it, that doesn't take away from your leaderliness um, to be like, hey, look, this is why. Um, and this is why you shouldn't have your feelings hurt. What, what yeah. do you say about that? Oh, and then I, I, I think that when Elliot says that he doesn't fight, it's just that 
the same thing that another guy with a weaker sense of himself who's more insecure as a leader might perceive it as a fight. But Elliot, it's just like, we're just having a conversation, figuring something out. Like it doesn't hit the threshold of him saying, why are you disrespecting me? We're having a fight right now because he can just handle it more confidently. So it's about how you perceive it. And remembering that marriage is a sacrament and a way to help you grow spiritually, we should expect to see all kinds of parallels between marriage and just the spiritual life generally, which is that all kinds of trials and struggles can come your way and that you grow through them. You don't say there's something radically wrong here because I'm having difficulty. Instead, you just right. face up to it and grow as a result of it. So if you look at what the saints and mystics talk about as like the steps of the spiritual life, one of the ways that I get guys to look at conflict and tension in marriage is in those terms. So there's some kind of trial that comes your way, right? You're, you're tested. You might sulk about it and bitch a bit to begin with and wish it wasn't happening. Then you're like, okay, this is really happening. I guess we have to struggle through and figure out the best way to do this. We can lean on each other and learn from it. And it's going to change us for the better. Then you achieve some kind of victory once you pull through. Then you might feel a bit of shame as you look back at some of those old behavior patterns. Like, I'm so dumb. Why did I ever behave like that? Why did I think that then? I can't believe it. Then you forgive yeah. each other, like, oh, we recognize now what went wrong. But then guess what? The whole point of having grown together through that difficulty is the cycle is going to repeat, right? You're yeah. going to go back to the yeah. beginning again. There'll be a new trial and you'll just keep ascending together. Hopefully, like Tim says, you're going to get longer between those bad periods where you feel like you're not fully connected. But each time you use one to grow together spiritually and improve in virtue, you're going to be able to handle more. And God's going to send you more. There's no save button where suddenly you can <laughs> just say, that's it now. We we completed marriage. We're just going to hang out and never have to have any difficulties ever again for the rest of our lives. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Those, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I married someone without a female tyrannical impulse at all. Also, um, Steph, Steph, in a lot of ways, with problem solving, she just thinks like a dude. I mean, right now, as we talk, like we, we're putting in the luxury vinyl floor and in, in the bathroom, we just put upstairs and and she's just doing it <laughs> like she. So she just kind of reasons through problem solving more like a male. So there's very there's just in my situation, there's never any tyrannical female, but like everyone has feelings. And so I think the main the another sort of situation, a lacuna that, that counts is a spat that Elliot might not have been counting as a spat is um, when most men are away from the home by day and they deputize the wife to do stuff. And if you get home and you're like, this is not what I meant to do this. And like, well, you deputize me. I thought I'd use my own judgment. And a lot of men get mad. I mean, men in healthy situations are free to get mad because at least they're in a healthy enough situation to acknowledge your, your share if this is the deputy. But that is the relationship. Like the, the man's the head, the woman runs the family. And the man's the sheriff, the woman's the deputy. And so there are going to be disagreements um, that are, like, oh, I thought you meant this. And then like, like, no, no, this is bad. I meant to do homeschool this way. It's natural um, for any two human beings. I mean, you can't tell me all the sensitive guys out there that, um, oh, like you should never accommodate a woman's feelings. Like most of the guys out there are, are, are having tons and tons of emotions and feelings like Women for women, it's natural to have. For guys, it's not even natural to be that in um tuned into your feelings. So a lot of times it's just like a good woman will be like, Well, I, I wanted to please you. I wanted to do what you said. Yeah, I you told me to do this. I thought to do it this way. And it's guys sort of getting mad. And so there there are you, you constant. What constantly needs to be happening in marriage, the main currency is communication. And I just think people don't communicate now. I think they're watching reality TV or whatever. And so what, what we're calling a spat is particularly the prompts we give in Leave and Cleave, the book, are just like, here's here's how you, you, you keep it positive and you're actually stronger at the end of each fight. Mm -hmm. You grew a little closer together with each spat. And hopefully the spats don't happen that often because you don't need the spats to grow together. You grow together through the, the sex and the fun too throughout the weeks and months and years. But if you have one every two weeks, try to make that one every uh, month. 
and you get closer by a millimeter each time you have one. And the, the main mantra is just like, there's no I, there's no you, there's we. And that's because you're one flesh. Uh, on Fraser, Fraser and Niles talk about like how they resolve their disputes. They're close brothers. And they're like, we just take turns apologizing. You apologize for the last one. So I'm up. I have to apologize. <laughs> That's kind of, it's hilarious because they're both like massive um, intellects. It's kind of babyish. And it, it expresses that when you're fighting with someone that you love, but you're not one flesh with, a loss is still an L and a win is still a W. Like, yes, you know, Niles, you know, they're, they're like IQ 150. And Niles is like, yes, it's your turn. They're trying to figure out who apologized last. It's still an L for Frazier if his turn is up to apologize. Mm -hmm. That's not what it is. If you're married, if neither of you is a tyrant, the man nor the woman, you're truly reasoning with recto ratio and you're just trying to get at the truth, which is really what dialogos is about dialogos um then all you win you're one flesh it's not like you versus your your even close brother or friend as long as you're like oh yeah yeah my my wife is legitimately right now i know i'm not really preaching to the choir because most guys out there are run by tyrannical feminist wives and this isn't what happens at all recto ratio has got nothing to do with it but if you once you're cultivated in your household to the proper habits and you and your wife are just trying to figure out what's really right. And you're like, okay, no, in this one, I really was wrong. Um, then it's, there's no you, there's no me, there's just us. And we both win as long as we come to recto ratio. That's the philosophically oriented marriage. And um, that's the marriage that, I mean, that's truly what dialogue is about. What we're talking about is dialogue during disagreement. And um, I think we have, we've really... We've really softwired, I think, the right language. We we started using it ourselves for these occasional things, and it just works really well. And it takes more communication rather than less. Uh, follow mm -hmm. up the next day, three days later, five days. Not with every little disagreement, but you're, you know, one, three, four, five, six times whatever it is for your couple times per year. Your biggest arguments, it should be infrequent anyway. Use it for those, and it'll it'll work. What what do you think of that, Nick? Fight, I guess, to me, has the connotation of desiring injury. And that, I think, should be extremely rare. Like, maybe if you're pushed well, super yeah. far. I mean, it should be never, obviously, but we're we're humans and, and we have raspable appetites. So maybe in, like, the heat of the moment, like, you say something just to cut a little bit more. But 999 times out of 1,000, that should be not the goal it's just striving to figure out what's correct what's the best course of action um and yeah emotions are involved in that but i guess maybe that's partly why i sort of err on the side of like talking like elliot did which is like oh well you know just never fight i guess by that i just mean like never try to cut never try to injure never try to wound um because something peterson said that i thought was really really profound is especially because men and women are unequally matched in dialogue most of the time. Um, men can reason more steps into the future. They might have a, a larger vocabulary. They might have been thinking about this all day and the woman wasn't even thinking about this, whatever it is. Um, he said, it's your duty as the husband to try and steal man, your wife's point. If she's not good at articulating herself, it's in your best interest to try and steel man her point so you can truly understand what she's saying. Because if all you're trying to do is defeat her in the argument, then congrats, you're living with a defeated wife. And if but you're think of the truly of one that. flesh, that's think of the like, irony of that. He's he's literally missed the whole point of life and she's got it. And he ought to be listening to her. And he's like, you got to steal. He's like condescending. <laughs> this woman yeah. became a Catholic. He's a idiot who, th who yeah. talks like goofy, like a goofball, like a Muppet and doesn't does get it. Talk. And still, talk. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. He needs to listen to his wife right. in this right. account. And yes. well, guys, of course, people out there that caricaturize me as like the ultimate toxic patriarch guy. I'm like, no, no, no. Like P Peterson's wife is smarter than than he is when it comes to the most important aspect of life. 
she's a she became a Catholic. And he just like sits on the side and is like, well, the archetype, so blah, blah, blah. It's retarded. And this she, like, is survives so cancer. She comes to the church. She's praying the rosary. She's doing podcasts, praying the rosary. And he's like, well, what do you mean by God? Yeah. Just listen to yeah, this then, woman. <laughs> and then he has books on like, well, you have to do your best to steal man what she's saying. And, um, you know, you're it's like, you, dude, you don't get it. I, I, I don't like Peterson being considered one of the patriarch guys because he, he no, mean, no, he no. Can't. And I wasn't I was not quoting him as if he were, but simply the, the concept of if you are one flesh, the idea of defeating your wife in an argument is quite foolish because now you're it, it's you. Right. This is your the other part of you. So like you're defeating yourself. But also, even if you see her as like a separate person. You're now living with a defeated woman. But like, does that make you feel her. good? Like convincing her. And and guys, some guys, I, I don't know if this is what Elliot was saying. I'm not not trying to straw man Elliot's position, but some guys who are strong and don't have feminist wives incline toward this. I think Elliot was like, well, you don't want to reason with her like she's a dude. It's like, well, yeah, your your man is the head and woman's the heart, but. She does have an intellect and you don't want to always just be saying like, oh, I can't reason with her. These, so like the marital spat cycle should be about both the head and the heart. It should be reasoning. And you even are reasoning about the emotions and you're reasoning through, oh, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean to come down so hard on you. Here's what I really meant. Like that's all, the heart is rational and the head is also inclined to the emotions. I mean, because right. the head really what feels emotion. So it's a false dichotomy and people ought to be reasoning together with their wives. They shouldn't just dismiss them as silly. I mean, the, you know, Jordan Peterson's wife's conversion to the faith was intellectual in the first place and she figured it out before he did. So I, people aren't going to believe kind of the the position I'm staking out here, but it's, it's what I truly believe. It's also, I'm also biased because I'm married to an extremely rational woman that that does well with this, but women are more emotional than men. So you reason about emotions is what ends up happening with the um the kinds of spats. And I I don't think all fights are in, inclined to hurting. So and not all fights are fist fights. A fight's a spat. I guess these are terms of art we're using, even like relieving and recleaving. But I just have a strong bias toward anytime you're living with another adult. It doesn't matter. Men are more intellectual, women are less intellectual, but women are still fully ego-formed adults. Hopefully your wife is not a non-ego-formed adult listeners out there. You're going to have to be doing a disproportionately large amount of your time communicating and sort of re-communicating about earlier communication. Though this is what I meant. I don't, I don't mean the kind of hell that guys with crazy feminist wives, 98% of the guys out there are going through. I mean like even the kind of stuff you do with your friends. I mean, and Nick, since you've been to town, we even have these things. We're like, no, this is what I meant. And I mean, you and I are working on five ventures together. There were a couple of men and there, there's occasional like hurt feelings on both parts. So with a woman, a really rational woman, there, it should be expected to be a little higher. Um, it's an externality, but it's an externality that if you do the right way, it brings you closer together. I'm just not down with the, oh, you should never talk. You should never reason. There should never be loggerheads. That's just not how it is when you're living with, unless you're living in a household of children, it should be the man kind of walking the wife through the stuff. And, you know, sometimes men get short tempered. I admit it. I do. And that's why if you think about the fact that humility is the foundation of virtue. And if you're one of the guys who likes to really geek out about all this stuff, look at Lagrange's book, Three Ages of the Interior Life, Volume 2, when he has the diagram about how all the virtues interrelate. And it's got basically like faith in Christ at the bottom as the bedrock. And then one step above that, the foundation of the whole thing is humility. So that applies mm -hmm. for patriarchy too. There's no yeah. patriarchy, no genuine masculinity without humility. Everything that Tim's been talking about there is basically have yeah. the sense to know what you don't know, like when you need to learn when you might be wrong and trust that because you're a smart guy and you married a woman whose opinion you respect, it's okay to seek her advice and when she's right to act on it as well. And the saddest thing about the idea that women are emotional, therefore you can't listen to them. It's often the guys who are like most autistic in a way and lack emotion 
who can actually learn the most from listening to their wives precisely because they are more emotional. They see things like in color rather than black and white. But if you're really right. proud and really insecure and you can't admit being wrong ever, you're going to struggle with that. Like what Tim just said is such a good example. Steph's putting down some vinyl flooring right now. I know guys who for like a month after that would be having a, a fit about it mentally thinking, does that mean that she's challenging my authority because putting vinyl flooring <laughs> down is the man's role? How, oh, I'm so furious. The, dis the disrespect. Yeah. And yeah. it would it would build up into something that would cause genuine tension, whereas you're not going to think about it twice. Yeah, I mean, like, I, she's half Mexican. She's half white, but she's also half Mexican. So if I look outside and the lawn's just mowed, boom, I shouldn't be uh, surprised, <laughs> you know? It's, it's a convenience. Um, she doesn't mow the lawn, but stuff like that, fix it stuff, it's in half of her chromosomes to just like figure out how to like do the menial labor around the house yeah yeah and well, yeah. she'll come in and joke about it i'm like this is this is amazing so that i mean her strength is one tenth of mine but yep. she's good at that and and that you know she's also really good at working working through fights but i guess i just want people to take uh, this is kind of the next step after you've accepted patriarchy in your heart is concupiscence means you're both fallen and the, the women out there are goofballs. The men out there are goofballs. All of us are goofballs and you, you are going to, you are going to get in fine. Now they should be rare that they get, that they take longer than 10 seconds, you know, the misunderstandings, but it's, the guys are not perfect to be a patriarch. You don't have to be perfect. This is again, sort of the, um, I will submit to him if he's worthy of submission. Um, uh, spurious lie that I, I did no guys by being a patriarch it doesn't mean you're perfect it just means you're male and therefore by maleness is leadershipness and femaleness is submissionness mm -hmm. and so that doesn't mean you're the perfect le the consummate leader you yep. and also to be female is to be a counselor on the side she just needs to be a humble counselor who gives you her, her suggestion if you're like good suggestion i'm not going to take it i'm going to do the opposite she's humble enough to not throw a fit, but that doesn't mean her feelings might not be hurt a little bit. You can double back and be like, Hey, by the way, that was smart. Given the parameters of how you were thinking about this problematic, I was thinking about it with wider parameters, the problematic. And therefore that's why I went with the other way. That that's, that's what a good leader does. Also being complex. a humble leader means what, what's that? It's complex to him. Cause what it means is that like shock, horror, surprise, patriarchy might look a bit different from marriage to marriage. So I know a guy yeah. who, his wife gave up her career as a CPA, right? And she, she runs the household finances for him, does all the budgeting and stuff because she's really good at it. Like yeah. he, he knows that he can allocate her to that and she's better at it than he is. And yeah. some people will be thinking, but the, the, the finances are the man's job. Like I must do the finances because that's what the rules say. No, in, in this case, it's actually better that he delegates it He's bringing the money in, but she's going to produce a better budget and help them stick to it better because that's her skill right. and he can use that. Right. And that doesn't mean he ultimately doesn't hold the decision on whether to make a purchase. It's just she's the one producing, though. Here are the receipts. Here's, here, you know, I, I kept all the books. Here's uh, the information as a help me. It's perfectly normal exactly. yep. uh, that she keeps the checkbook here. This will aid you in your decision. So yep. as long as the principle is that yep. the man makes the decision. The particulars, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. And so what you'll get is caricatures of the patriarchy where there's only one way to skin a cat. No, there's only one way to articulate the given principle, but the um, expedients used to reach that, there's actually a lot of ways to chart your course. And that's 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 what we're really doing with the Leave and Cleave book that's coming out in mid-September is we're showing people here are the best ways to chart your course so that patriarchy is the first thing, but you're not caricaturizing it and and you're getting through these particulars what we're doing we the same thing with our parenting chapter we're like don't follow the experts follow yourself if you are a christian parent of goodwill follow yourself and the irony is that we're we're kind of writing a book as expert but we're just giving the power the republic back to the people we're saying once you get the principles of patriarchy properly ordered you're going to do it your own way 
And um, again, I, I'm very curious. And it's, it's more complex than that. There's more specifics we get into, but I'm, I'm curious what the reception will be like for this book. Again, go to timothyjgordon.com and pre-order today. Pre-order the class, the One Flesh class, also on Timothy J. Gordon. It's it's um people people don't know that people were only convinced like last five years that patriarchy is even like it, it's the only model for a successful family that where everyone will get to heaven. They didn't even think they thought that was, when I went on Matt Fred and announced I was reading writing this book. People like you're defending patriarchy, like yes. So you can't tell me that five little years later. Not only has everyone been convinced, but they also know how to do it. Because like in these books, we weren't saying how to do it. We were just justifying this is the correct model. And now people are kind of catching up. It's like, well, the, I think the correct model is here, these specifics. Yep. That's all I got. Um, yeah. But it, great. Again, great discussion. I love when we're having discussions. It's the best shows. And everyone's, you know agreeing about the the big principle but um maybe maybe having a, a, a differing point of view like you were saying happened with you guys in the baskerville interview hound of the baskerville interview last week totally that's yeah steven excited for steven. the book man really excited for the book especially since yeah. you like te teased us by saying here are the here are the scripts for how to get out of a fight and then didn't tell us what the scripts are. I was kind of hoping we'd get a sneak peek, but yeah, you get what well, you got to buy the book for that. That's um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to read over your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or just Xerox, Xerox that page and send them to everyone who might be interested in Patrick. Well, so it's 35 bucks. Now that's for pre-order. You get a book signed by both of us and you'll, you'll get it right away. Um, then that's, you know, the, we normally price our, our books. We've only had one self-published book that's Steph's because what happened with Tan. Um, usually I think we we I think that's usually 25. It will probably come down and that won't be signed copies and you won't get them the earliest. But um 35 bucks for uh, pre pre-order it today and pre-order the class. And did you guys have anything? I mean, I think we should start really boosting not just well, I mean, we should boost the fact that on um us matchmaking, we've we've had we made four uh, engagements and, um, and that, that will does coaching. I think you should call that out. I think Mike should call that out. I think Nick, we should be talking about what you're doing. I think we should be doing that every time. Yeah. We're, we're you know? kind of terrible at self-promoting here, but yeah, will, will, how can people, um, work with you? So if you follow me on X, you can just click the link in my bio. That takes you to a completely free community called the Patriarchy Project, where you can learn all kinds of practical ways to improve your marriage and just develop as a man in all kinds of areas. If you need specific one-to-one -one help with me, then you'll figure out inside that group how to get in touch about more personalized coaching. What I like to do is basically give all the information out for free, and if guys can use that to fix things, then that's great. If you want lots of one-to-one -one attention and guidance about implementing it step-by-step -step to fit it to your particular situation, then that's what the coaching is about. So you can go there, X, bio, click the link, free to join. Hope to see you inside. And then Mike uh, also does one-to-one -one coaching. Just follow him on Instagram at Mike Pantile. If you look at the link in his bio, he also does one-to-one -one coaching. Um and then I do not do any coaching. Don't listen to anything that I have to say, say about that. But uh, we are, Tim and I are working on what a woman is to be coming out. God willing, this winter, late fall or early winter is, is the goal. We're nearly out of production. I have one more interview to film next Saturday or Sunday. Very exciting. And then it's into the edit where I get to sit in front of this computer screen for about three months straight and put this film together. Very excited for that. Um, and yeah, if you want to get married in the next 12 months, go to www.retvrn.us and Will and Tim will find you a spouse. And uh, so far we've done that four times successfully. And a lot of our uh, people are still dating each other. Um, so if you're under the age of 30, and you're a practicing Catholic, and you're not a goofball. I mean, we're all goofballs. But if you're like slightly above average of goofballery, we will we'll find you a spouse. Amen. And the and the price is about to go up. 
price yeah. is about to go like, up. It hasn't like changed today. on the site right now. So get your butts in there. All right. That's all I have to say. Good to see you guys. God bless. See you on the next one. You too. Take care. Okay.